Hi everyone, we'll be waiting two to three minutes before starting the webinar to accommodate uh, for the folks that are in the middle of connecting. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us and thanks for being part of our community. My name is Valen Kolika and I'll be your host for today. Our, our co-hosts are here as well, Ryan Heffernan and uh, Jason Cohen. A few reminders before we start. If you have issues viewing the stream at any time during the presentation and are using the web browser version of Teams, uh, please refresh your browser. And uh, if you're using the desktop app, that is, uh, please exit and rejoin. This simply um, seems to help uh, with uh, connection issues at least. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared publicly. We will post the recordings on our community page at aka.ms slash security webinars. Uh, closed captions in several languages are available during the live broadcast and uh, you can enable them by uh, clicking on the CC button located at the lower right uh, corner of your screen. Uh, please feel free to ask questions at any time by typing them in the live event Q&A window and you can do so by clicking on the ask a question button. Be aware that any questions you post will be publicly visible. But if you prefer, you can post your question anonymously and you can do so by checking the box right below where you enter it. Now we often get many questions on these webinars and we will do our best to respond to all of them in real time. In the event if the answer was not provided or if you have or if you may have additional questions that is post the event, uh, please don't hesitate to raise them on our tech community forum at aka.ms slash Azure Sentinel community. Uh, we love to hear your feedback on how we can improve the, these webinars and we can do so at uh, aka.ms slash security webinars and all these links that I'm mentioning, I'll be posting them here shortly in the chat window. I would also like to invite you to join our public community by visiting us at aka.ms slash security community. Now, this is the best way to ensure that you don't miss any future webinars or uh, major announcements. Uh, there in our community, you can speak directly to our engineering teams that create our security products. You'll be able to influence our product designs and get early access to changes by doing things like participating in uh, private previews, which by the way, you can sign up for it at aka.ms slash prsec.com. In there, you can request uh, features, give feedback, review our product roadmaps, register for events or join webinars like this. We simply believe that the best way to improve our products is by removing any barriers between you and the people that create them. So we hope you'll join us. In today's session, Ofer Shazaf will take us over the turbocharging of Azure Sentinel information model. This will be a part three of the previous two that he did. Uh, now we're talking about uh, making sure of a normalization helps 
performers rather than impacting it. Ofer is a principal program manager with our Azure Sentinel team. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to him. Ofer, the floor is yours. Thank you. So good day, everyone. Uh, as Valon mentioned, I'll talk about ASIM, Azure Sentinel Information Model today. Um, for those that didn't meet me before, uh, I've been with the Azure Sentinel team for the last three years, which is always. Um, and I'm excited to continue our journey with Azure Sentinel. Prior to that, I've spent many years at ArcSight, so SIM is my middle name. Uh, and one of the things that we lacked until recently in Azure Sentinel was normalization or a standard information model. So around less than six months ago, I moved, uh, I started or I continued the journey to make sure that uh, we, we, we provide you with normalization. With this in mind, uh, I've already done two webinars on ASIM, the Azure Sentinel Information Model. The first one was an overview, uh, so mainly for users, how do you use ASIM? Uh, and the second one was for developers, so the people uh, that are writing parsers. For example, if you have a custom data source and you want to write parser for it, uh, part two will help you understand how to do that. Uh, the uh, session today will focus on something that we introduced uh, recently, uh, and I want to uh, thank Jeroen Fuchtman and Yuval Noor who are, will answer questions and help me do that, where we moved forward uh, and added, uh, improved significantly the performance of uh, ASIM, so it, that it does not just uh, not cost you in performance, uh, but also can help performance, and I'll explain why and how in this uh, presentation. I'll start with a single slide recap of ASIM. Um, it's good for those that know ASIM. Uh, it's a gap for those that came here and know nothing. I hope that you'll still find uh, the webinar useful, but the first two parts pointed to above are an important background. I'll then talk about uh, the parser performance challenge and why did we have to do such work to improve performance. And I'll explain how parameterized parsers um, help us to provide a significant performance boost with Azure Sentinel. And in KQL in general, uh, I would like to mention that what we did here is um, high-end KQL usage, which you can use outside of ASIM as well. Uh, after I explain how to use it and what are those parameterized parsers, I'll uh, move to the developers around and explain how to write parameterized parsers. Again, KQL on steroids. So, ASIM recap. One slide on, and you don't really need to see it alone. So, um, one slide on ASIM. So, um, normalization to start with, uh, is the concept that we want all the data that is received by Azure Sentinel to be uh, uniform uh, across different sources. So if you have, say, a, an authentication event that was received uh, from Windows or from Linux, or a Windows authentication event that was received through a Microsoft Defender for Endpoint or through the Windows event system, you want them all to look the same. Why should they look the same? They should look the same because an analyst would want to be able to easily use them. And if he knows about a single presentation, things are easier for him. And as important, it's also a way to make sure that uh, when you write analytics on top of the data, you write it once and it support any source you'll drive into um, Azure Sentinel. So that's normalization and that's what ASIM is about. How did we implement it? So we started by defining schemas. We defined schemas for um, top uh, event types that many sources deliver information in, such as authentication, as I mentioned, network activity, web activity, DNS, uh, file activity, etc. We are not uh, finished yet. We are. We have missing schemas we have to release, but we covered the most. Uh, I hope that the DHCP schema would be public later today. So we are working. So those are schemas. Those are documents on uh, the Microsoft documentation page. How do you actually implement that? How do you actually use it? So we use today 
uh, KQL functions, which enable to normalize the data in query time. In query time is that as part of your uh, query, when you write a query when using Azure Sentinel, say interactively as part of an analytic rule in a workbook, you use a, a KQL function instead of a table name. And um, this KQL function hides all uh, the uh, mechanics of getting the raw data and transferring it to a new form a format. There are two level of functions. The first one is a source specific function. Say uh, uh, we'll talk about it later. DNS is our example today. Uh, you have the Microsoft DNS events and you have an Infobox DNS event. So we have parsers that will take a Microsoft DNS event or an Infobox DNS event and will transform them into a uniform format. But when you write content or analyst queries data, they don't want to know about where they came from. So we have a aggregation union parser that takes all of the uh, source specific parsers and just does a simple union between them. So it's very easy um, to use uh, the parsers. I'll show a small demonstration of that when I talk about the solution later on. I don't want to just go into an async demonstration, but as part of demonstrating ACM uh, supercharged, I'll also show you ACM, obviously. The performance challenge. So um, what is the performance challenge? So as I mentioned, we are doing a, a parsing uh, at query time. So each event, which is when the query runs, has to be parsed and, if, and fields are, should needs to be extracted from the raw data. By itself, this is not a major performance challenge. The performance challenge comes because uh, when you write queries in every system and in Azure Sentinel, KQL, uh, the best practice is to filter early so that, for example, you don't process too many uh, events. Uh, and you also want to filter on native fields. So um, native fields are indexed in the database, in the log analytics database. And if you filter, if your conditions are over native fields, performance is amazing. If you start to parse everything and filter afterwards and filter on parsed extended fields, performance drops very considerably. Challenge with parsers is that if you parse everything, if you write a parser that assumes all the table, we'll see it in a second, uh, you'll find yourselves parsing everything before you start doing anything else. Just to demonstrate how significant the issue is. So for example, um, this query runs over the syslog table, but it looks for a specific type of event in the syslog table, the audit type, it's a Linux event, and it tries to extract something from there, the event ID. If we delete this line, the extend function runs over all the events and tries to extract from every event whether it has oddity or doesn't have it oddity in it. Uh, this is very, very costly in terms of performance. But if we add this line back in, syslog message is a physical field, has is a very optimized operator. And by checking if we are processing the right events up front, we make the uh, query run four times faster in this example. And this is a small set. The larger the set, the older the events, the more uh, uh, significant the performance challenges. I did a very synthetic example to show how important things can be. And I took this very simple um, query, uh, looking for the word Shazaf in a message field in a large table. Shazaf was not there, zero results, uh, and it took nothing. Then it's something very simple. I just created a extended calculated fields called M that attaches offer, my first name, to the message and searches for the same Shazaf, getting no results. And it took so much more. So you want to filter always on physical fields and you want to filter before you do anything else. But parsers do not allow for that. Let's look at this one. This is a real rule 
that exist today. Now, it's not an ASIM rule. The challenge is there already today. ASIM, as I mentioned, can solve things which are slow today. Infoblox by uh, NIOS. Infoblox is a, a DNS security system or DNS server, uh, and it sends events in using syslog. So the Infoblox NIOS parser parses syslog. Um, so the cost of parsing is there even if you don't normalize. That's the major cost. Now, as a connector parser, the function Infoblox now tries to parse any event that Infoblox will send. The only problem is that most rules or most queries actually look for a specific type. So we just parsed everything, all the DNS events in the system, and immediately after that, we filter only relevant events for our query. In this case, only the uh, uh, DNS query uh, events. So we wasted a lot of time. Now, in practice, the rule itself, the logic of the rule itself, only requires errors. So essentially, uh, DNS queries that return non-existent domain. This is a very small fraction of the events. So um, in the first place, the fact that I ran Infoblox BIOS NIOS, the parser, on all events and filtered by the event type and by the response code only later makes this uh, parser, th this query very inefficient. And until the method I'll present today, there was nothing to do about it apart from not using the parser. Now, a word about performance. Uh, I've touched on that uh, in so many webinars in the past, but it's very important today, so worth touching on. Why is performance important when running, when using Azure Sentinel? Uh, you don't pay for the servers. Um, you don't have to buy extra power. Uh, it's a SaaS service. There are a few things to consider. First of all, Donnelly spends time in front of the screen. If things take more than he'll wait for he or she will wait more so by definition you want things to run faster moreover there is a timeout uh, there is a limited amount of time that the query can run if things are really inefficient and i do see those from time to time especially at very large uh, customers so you know the one percent at the top things can time out uh, and uh, if you use sentinel mostly for analytic rules then it's sort of a binary if things do not run, time out, it doesn't matter how much time they take, but if they time out, your rule didn't run. So you want to be efficient. And the methods we'll discuss today, um, two were charge things by, by uh, orders of magnitude. So you'll see the difference. So how do we solve that? How do we make sure that uh, even when using parsers, you are able to make sure that uh, you filter by native fields and that you filter early on, not just after the parser created a normalized fields which are not native. The answer is parameterized parsers. And I'll move into a short demo for that. Let's bring the other screen here. I always do that. Sorry for that, guys. Yeah, getting the camera back to where it should be. So I prepared a few queries here which demonstrate um, uh, how we work, how you would work with parameterized uh, 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 parsers. Um, the one, uh, the one uh, schema that we already uh, implemented parameters for is DNS. That's the first, that's our starting point we are working on additional ones so converting all our schemas to use parameterized parsers but uh, i wanted to share it with you today so especially if you write parsers you'll be ready um, so um, until now if you know uh, asim uh, we always used uh, imdns as the way to a uh, query for uh, dns events using asim uh, and there were no par parameters uh, to be as competitive as possible and explain in a minute why we did a small change. IMDNS works as, as expected, but it does expect, accept parameters, which I'll explain in a second. But we also added uh, ASIM DNS, 
uh, as a an alternative, which does exactly the same, but does not accept parameters. And in a second, I'll, I'll show you why. But let's look at those and use them to show how to work with parameters, without parameters, uh, and uh, compare the two methods. So when you just use ASIM, you run ASIM DNS. I'll run the first one here. You get uh, um, results over the last 20 minutes, and you can see this is a normalized event. It has standard fields which are available for every uh, normalized event, such as event type, uh, event product, this is Microsoft DNS server, even the event schema version, uh, as well as DNS specific fields, which are now uh, uh, common across all sources. DNS query, DNS query type, name, etc. This enables writing source agnostic content on top of a uh, of a, a DNS data. A more complex one again. If you don't use parameters, you lose a lot of where a lot of where clauses. Now I'm looking for 180 days, so a long time, and I want to know if the DNS query, so what was asked for, include ninja and bad guy. Now. Um, this is, by the way, surprisingly fast. One of the reasons that I'm, there's not in a lot of data in this workspace. Uh, it's a demo one. Uh, but the challenge is that whatever ASIM DNS does, okay, the filtering is done after everything was parsed, which is just a, a, a huge challenge. How do we solve that? So let's see how you do the exact same uh, queries with now with IMDNS, which is a parser that accepts parameters. So I just want to do the first one. I want to go and check for the events for the last 20 minutes. Instead of doing where time generated greater than a go 20 minutes, I'm using the start time parameter. The start time parameter with the same value. All parameters are optional. All parameters will have a default value, which is what you would expect. It's documented if you don't provide a value. So start out without specifying start time, it means from epoch, from always. If you don't specify end time, it means until now. So if I run that, I'll get exactly the same. The same events. I can also use the domain as any uh, parameter, which is a very useful one because in many cases, that's exactly what you want to do with a, a, with a DNS source, you want to check if uh, bad guys were accessed. So IOCs, we'll see later on how to drive a list of IOCs. Now, I mentioned the second query here, this one, is very heavy computationally in large systems because it checks in a computed field for a lot of values and because it looks for a lot of uh, data. What I can do here is I can do here both as parameters. There is a subtlety here. I do need to pass the parameter B differently here when I want to pass a dynamic value to the domain has any parameter. And lastly, I can, for example, run just on missing on error domain names. So if I going back to the example I showed before about why should I parse everything when I want just error codes, I can uh, parse just by um, by the response code name. Now we'll talk about how this is implemented in uh, a bit later on, in a few minutes actually. I do want to show you one thing now before moving on and getting out of the browser and back to the PowerPoint. Behind there, here there are functions, uh, and I mentioned the Infobox parser function. Uh, those functions accept parameters. Um, and um, by the way, most of the complexity of the parser is just the parsing. It's not what I'm showing today. I'll show what's the delta. The important thing here is that uh, these days, uh, you know, let me start over. These days, Logalytics has a very nice uh, interface around working with functions. So you can do everything which I'm talking about here through the user interface. Usually, we'll talk about it a bit later. If you want to deploy a lot of parsers, do things seriously, you'll go into ARM templates. But uh, let's go to the IMDNS uh, function that I just mentioned. We can go here, we can load the function code, and you can see here the function code here in the browser. And 
Oh, why is that? Let's go to demos. Uh, let's go to the Vim info blocks. It's a bug. No, it's Vim DNS info blocks. No, no, I found it. It's just that I don't have save edit function details here. So I'll go to a different workspace where I know this works. I hope it works. Otherwise, I'll revert to a screenshot, which I have somewhere. So I'm again in the function interface. I'm looking for the same in for blocks. I load it in the function here. Yeah. So uh, that's what I was looking for, and I need to check why it didn't work in the other workspace. Uh, when I loaded the function code from the browser, you can see here that I can edit the function details. The actual parameters uh, are not part of the KQL, which is what you see on the left. They are part of uh, the definition here. You can add additional fields. Uh, you can delete fields, but the fields you see here are what you need to have when you define a parameter parser. Of course, it's not very handy to start typing adding when you define something, all those parameters, and that's why using an ARM template based on the ARM templates that we already created for parameter parsers is much easier. OK, uh, actually, I can show that as well. I did promise to explain why we have both ASIM parsers and IM parsers. And the reason for that is a bit um, requires explaining. Let's put it this way. It's uh, an issue that we are, we are over, um, bypassing. So if you know logo links, you know that the default time range for search is 24 hours. So if I do ASIM DNS limit, 10 or count. I'm essentially counting over the last 24 hours. Whatever number of events I have. Now, if I do Vim, uh, sorry, I am DNS, which I mentioned before, count, notice what happened. The time picker was changed to set in query. Now, log analytics would change the time range to set in query if it determines that the time generated field was used in the query. Now, the IMDNS parser actually uses the time generated field, but uh, does not provide a value because it's a parameter. So if I run this one, I'll get a lot more than 33,000. I got 2 million, which may not, it's totally okay. It's set in query and actually it's set in query to ever. It's just that I want, don't want a, a an analyst to not be aware and do something by mistake when you expect 24 hours. That's why our guideline is for analysts, you know, first line analysts, to always use the AC, the ASIM function, which is simpler, doesn't accept parameters, no performance benefits, but analyst just running something is better off running that way. But to always use the IMDNS function for advanced analysts and when using it in um, content, so in detection rules, for example. In terms of what they do, they are identical. It's the set in query, which requires us to have both of them. We hope that in the future this will be solved and IMDNS will be more uh, behave the way you expect and we'll be able to, uh, well, tell everybody to use the same one. By the way, Justin, you, you can set it to 24 hours and it will show the right number. It's just that you need to know that. So, um, uh, uh, explanation of our, why there are two. As I mentioned, uh, the currently parameters are available for the DNS schema. We've done an analysis of what actual queries require and we based our parameters on that. Notice that they are not always just a field. For example, uh, we have response as any prefix. So we identified that sometimes 
uh, responses, responses are IP addresses, and sometimes uh, the query looks for uh, subnets. So we used prefix here, etc. Uh, so our analysis was that. Uh, by the way, we are in preview. Uh, if you think, if you start using that and you'll find that another parameter is very much missing, we are open to listen about it and add it to our backlog. And of course, we are working on the list of parameters for the additional schemas we are working on. The, the next two schemas to gain parameter uh, support are network and authentication. How do you write parameter parsers? What's the, K, the KQL magic behind it? So, and here it's sort of more interesting than just please use that it's faster. Oh, sorry, uh, before that, uh, just a few examples of using that and the advantage in the, in, in the wild. So um, this is a real rule. This is a rule that waited a bit since we released uh, ASIM. Uh, we did not convert it to use normalized data. Uh, the reason is, is that it was very inefficient without parameters, and I'll explain why. So first of all, assume that we've converted to IMDNS. That's pretty easy. That we could have written here the IMDNS and convert the rule easily. However, notice that the rule runs on 14 days because the lookup for the threat intelligence indicator table here needs to be 14 days. But then after parsing DNS events, or IMDNS in this case, for 14 days, we take just one day out of it. So within 14 times the work needed. Moreover, we use join in order to compare the threat intelligence indicator table and the DNS events table. The number of actual results would be very small. However, domain name, uh, name are uh, in when you use IMDNS calculated fields, the join is very inefficient and things are just very slow. So this query is a query that doesn't work well without optimization. How do we solve that when using parameterized queries? So pretty easy. What we do is that when we call IMDNS, we provide the one day time frame. So that parsing is done only on one day of events, it's immediately 14 times faster. That's good. And we also provide here the list of domains, which is derived from here, as part of the pref filter. So we make sure that the actual domains derived from the thread intelligence table are searched very efficiently uh, on the raw data of the original DNS sources. Both together makes the query much, much faster, potentially faster than the original one. And obviously there's the big advantage. It runs on any DNS source that you have. Why do we need a join? That's interesting. Notice here that the condition domain as any is not the same as the join here. Domain as any means that um, the domain field, so the, the query that was done by the DNS server includes any of the domain listed. It's not identical to the domain listed. So it may return extra values which are not needed. The join at the bottom filter out of the remaining results, only the results which are exactly what we're looking for. Between us, security wise, not sure that's true, but we just uh, sometimes finding a part of a, a domain in the result set is good, but we wanted to be identical to the original security uh, detection. This is the example I showed you before, the one with Infoblox NIOS, which is inefficient as things are today already. So uh, we, we are here to improve things which are working much slower now. Uh, and of course, it works only on InfoBlocks. So how did you translate this one? That's our uh, rule. You can see that uh, it supports any DNS source. So you move from just InfoBlocks. We have today seven DNS sources supported in ASIM. We're working on an additional three, so 10 in a few days, I hope. Uh, so that's significant. You can add your own custom sources, so as many as you like. Now, we filter on NX domain uh, uh, using parameters. So we do very, very efficient NX domain 
uh, field tree, just the error codes. So it's much, much faster. And we also implicitly uh, filter only DNS events because the parsers will by default just take DNS events from any source. So if Infobox has a lot of DHCP events, those are not considered and are thrown away very early on. And on top of that, well, it's actually easier to write. It's much simpler. So until now I talked about making things happen faster. First, at least as fast as the original query. Secondly, even faster than the original query. And now I'm talking about easier to use. Those parameters makes things easier to use. They are sort of also maybe they are an option, but they're usability enhancement. And now I'll get into how to write. What's the magic behind those parsers? How do you write this IMDNS that actually works better than the Infobox uh, parser? And I'll actually take the Infobox parser as an example. So uh, that's the overview. The part here is how parsers are written until now, the regular ones. If you go to the second webinar I did, you'll see that we need to start with filter. For example, for Infoblox, it has to filter only the Infoblox uh, events from the uh, syslog table. Then we do parsing and then we do mapping. The initial filtering stays the same, no difference. The mapping is the same, no difference. And in the parsing part, we actually keep the original parsing. All we add is pre-filtering, a few lines of pre-filtering, and a few lines of post-filtering. The advantage is that it's just adding a few standard lines to any par any async parser you already wrote or you already wrote. There's no huge difference. Those lines requires understanding, but as you'll see later on, it's just essentially copying it from another DNS parser that does most of the trick. Obviously, there's another difference here. Um, we need parameters in the functions. So you need to understand how to write parameter, parameters in functions. Let's start with the parameters. So um, when you write KQL for functions, uh, you don't specify the parameters. The parameters, as you've seen before, are specified when you save them, which is both q and um, 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 not easy to understand declaratively when you read the function. So as in deploying, I would urge, uh, urge you to try to use ARM templates to define those those functions. Uh, there are many examples in our GitHub, uh, for example, our IM DNS. And when we write the functions, even though the KQL itself stays the same, we wrap them in this declarative uh, code. So we essentially, do a function within the function. And the internal function, this one, does specify the parameters. The external function just calls them. Uh, but it enables us to just have in the text the parameter list, which is very useful when you read things. So it, it's for usability. Essentially, the function could have been the KQL itself without whatever is around it. As I mentioned, what we actually have to add to the KQL that we already had as a parser is pre-filtering and post-filtering. So this is the pre-filtering code. Uh, it looks complex, agreed. However, all you have to do is copy it from another parser of uh, the same schema. They'll be nearly identical. Actually, all you have to do is you have to change the field on which the pre-filtering is done. So for example, um, for uh, Infoblox, I mentioned it's a syslog connector, so all the searches are done in the syslog message field. Um, if you have, it might be that it's not the same field in your source because the different values are stored around uh, uh, multiple fields in the source. So essentially, you'll have to think about what each one of those yellow boxes should be in your parser. But that's all. The rest stays the same. A lot of the complexity here, because the, 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 roughly speaking, the right part is just checking the conditions. The left part has a very specific uh, reason. It checks whether the parameters were actually provided, because if a parameter was not provided, the expectation is that it's not filtered on. So the part on the, on the left does exactly that. It checks that 
you actually specified a non-default value for the parameter. However, it's it's always identical. It's exactly the same for every DNS parser. So no need to uh, uh, change anything. So it's, as a matter of fact, you always copy that and change only the parts in yellow. This one subtlety, it doesn't change a lot, but sometimes a source would not have a field we parse by. For example, Cisco Umbrella is another DNS server and it does not log responses. So the response parameters, the response filters are not useful. Now, when we thought about what the expectation is, the expectation is that if a filter is applied, if we are looking for a specific IP address and the Cisco umbrella uh, log does not include any responses, so to return nothing. So the uh, uh, what we do is we keep only the left side, only the left side essentially for those specific parameters. So you see that we check if the response says IP is the default value. If it's not a default value, if somebody specified an IP address, we just return nothing. The work goes fails. So that's the one subtlety that may make things not be identical to the block above. Now, pre-filtering has it it, 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 provi it may provide unnecessary records. The reason is that we filter on the syslog message, and what we look for may be uh, available, maybe part of something else. It may be part of, for example, looking for an IP address, but it's not part of the response. It's actually the client IP address because the syslog message is everything. But we did enough. We did the filtering. Parsing is done a very small number. All we need to do is after parsing, fix things. That's why we do post filtering. Post filtering is another uh, um, um, piece of uh, KQL that comes after the parsing code. I'll show how it looks in the full Infoblox uh, parser in a second. Uh, that does exactly the same. It's exactly the same test for the fields where there is a need for it, but here it's not syslog message, it's the actually parsed fields. Show check. And that would eliminate the few uh, extra records that were filtered incorrectly before because the pre-filtering is a bit too coarse because it's not on parsed data. To summarize, I can discard this. So just going now to, um, GitHub uh, to show you the parsers themselves. So uh, you may know uh, you can go to ACM DNS. You can deploy all the parsers using a single click here. Uh, you can also actually today go to ACM and deploy all of ACM, all the parsers in a single click to your workspace. Uh, we are working, by the way. We will get to there pretty soon. I don't have a specific timeline that the parsers will be there in your workspace by default. So you wouldn't need even to do that. But if you go to the ACM parsers, go to the product parsers, let's take the Infoblox one that we just discussed. So uh, if I go through that and do some code review. So it's the syslog table. And this is the pre-filtering part that you just copy from each syslog, sorry, DNS parser to the other. Once this is run. This part here is the original parser. Um, the one that it's not easy. Infoblox is hard to parse, but that's a parser before parameters. So the only area which I added was actually this. And then after the parsing, there is the post filtering part where we fix results when we do the conditions over the parsed queries. And then there is a whole part, as I mentioned, about mapping, post-processing, getting the right names, which again remains the same. The thing here is parsers can be easy, can be hard. This is a hard parser for different reasons. Um, Microsoft DNS parser, I, I might show it here just to finish, is a much simpler one. Uh, because the Microsoft DNS data is already parsed to start with. Uh, so it doesn't look as, but the pre-filtering part, and uh, actually there's no post-filtering part that's interesting, is the same. 
and then it's just a list of equals. So the parser itself doesn't look that intimidating, but the actual magic around parameters is the same. Anyways, uh, sort of recapping what I discussed today, uh, which slide would be the best for that, uh, I guess. I'll go to this one. So ASIM uses query time parsing, which means we run the parsers and the normalization as part of your query. Uh, this implies there might be a, a, a performance challenge, but the actual performance challenge is not parsing. It's because we filter too late in the game. We parse a lot, it might be billions of records, and then we filter sometimes 10 records. With parameters based parsers, we now allow you to provide parameters to the parser that will ensure that filtering is done early on and performance is really great. Sometimes it enables you to just be as efficient as Sentinel is without ASIM. Sometimes it makes things even faster than without ASIM because there are already parsers which are not efficient today, such as in the Infobox case. Uh, to use that, just use parameters in the parsers. And uh, to build such parsers, um, but you need to know your way around. Um, it requires to be to write parsers, but the change from the current non-parameter parsers to parameter parsers is not very big. So um, that was that for today. Uh, heavy stuff, agreed. Uh, and we we are in preview, so we'd love to hear from you, to learn from you what works, what doesn't work, and. At this point in time, I can't commit it for long, even help you write parsers uh, as long as you contribute them back and we can use them as part of for all other customers so we we'll, we can help write them. Thank you. Thank you, Ofer. This was great stuff. Indeed, deep dive, but hopefully for the ones that joined, we're able to uh, to to get some uh, out of it and uh, there is a question, although most of the questions were, well, I see some more com coming. Let me just uh, uh, do not think. OK, so uh, most of the questions were answered. There is one uh, asking uh, is uh, ASIM live or in preview and uh, are any name con conventions expected to change? OK. Um. So uh, ASIM is in public preview, which means it's alive and kicking, uh, but uh, we, to an extent, and this is a very official Microsoft verbiage around that, uh, we have somewhat more flexibility around changing things. Uh, we don't expect the schemas to change. Uh, it, it's a preview. If somebody calls us trolls and tells us we did something horribly wrong, we will change. Uh, I'll give you an example on that. Just uh, we had a big mistake in the DNS schema. Uh, uh, by the way, it's all documented publicly as public preview, but documented. Uh, and if I go to the DNS uh, schema here, um then we actually had to we deprecate a few fields because uh, we work we are aligned with the OSEM project O S S E M uh, and they approved our schema and then after release they said oh we got it wrong no blame game uh, and the field names should be a bit different so we did deprecate a few fields uh, but we keep them all supported for now so now all parsers do both query and DNS query. Query being the old one, DNS query being the uh, the new one, uh, and you see that because it's a private preview, I did mention a deprecation date for that, but it's a managed process, uh, and I hope that's the exception that we are not we are not trying to do that. Um, a, a lot of the changes during preview are actually with adding fields. For example, the DNS flags fields were added recently, but it's new. That's adding. That's less uh, troubling. Uh, so I hope that answers the questions in this regard. Um, thank you. And uh, to the jump, uh, to the folks who asked this question as far as the uh, name changes and all that. So when it comes to that, we I strongly uh, recommend that you join our uh, private preview uh, team. I have posted the uh, the link there that takes you to the form, so you're part of the of the 
product review roadmaps and uh, feedbacks and request features and so on. So let's see what's the next question here. Uh, OK, so we did provide the uh, uh, links to the rules that offer shared taking you to the GitHub, but then there's a question offer about if there's any uh, labs related to this presentation. Uh, no, no, uh, nothing. So first of all, just to make sure, uh, deploying the parsers is something you can do without any cost, without any effect on your live environment because it's query time parsing by just using the link I mentioned. So uh, let's assume just ASIM DNS, okay? Uh, go here, press this button, answer two questions, and you have all the parsers available in your workspace. What I don't have is a lab that has the data or specific DNS data for you to use. Of course, I present on workspace that had the data, but if you have DNS data from any of the sources listed here, so you see we have today one, two, three, four, five, six, um, um, you can deploy the parser easily on those workspaces. That's as much as I have to provide today. And Zscaler, uh, NX log and uh, Azure Firewall DNS are coming soon. OK, great, perfect. Uh, and recording of this webinar will be located in our, uh, let me also post it or repost it here, in our uh, aka.ms slash security webinars. If you scroll down below, uh, you'll find the recording session uh, broken down by uh, products. So. I see your own answered here, and I think that pretty much concludes everything. And somebody from Texas says Bokartov. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you got the language right, but the times are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bokartov means good morning. Uh, okay well thank you thank you offer appreciate it uh, excellent presentation and um, also thank you to the team here in the background thank you to you all and to yaron for answering all the incoming questions and uh, also the best way to ensure that you don't miss any future webinars or um, major announcements that is please visit our landing page at aka.ms slash security community uh, we have uh, lots of webinars coming into all the way till uh, mid-December. So if you haven't done that yet, uh, you can go to this uh, security community landing page and you'll find also the uh, security webinars. In fact, the link that I just shared also takes you to the registration part of the webinars. Uh, so also, we love to hear your feedback on how we can improve on these webinars. And please uh, take a minute by submitting your uh, your feedback at aka.ms. Uh, slash security webinar feedback. I want to thank uh, all of you for being part of our community and uh, for joining us on these webinars, and we hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.